Dennis couldn't be here today because he's at the Eva Beach Emergency Preparedness Fair, which I think is the largest uh, fair to date in uh, the state. Sure. And hundreds and hundreds of people attend that fair in Eva Beach. So I applaud you on the beginning of uh, doing this type of emergency preparedness here in West Maui and encourage you to keep it going because it just grows in momentum as you go. There's nothing more important to our families and to our homes than to be prepared. So it's my pleasure, I've been asked to speak a little bit about the homeowner's handbook and some of the uh, things that are in the handbook. I did bring a few copies, they're absolutely free of charge. Um, a, uh, if I run out, it's also available online at the uh, UH Manoa website. All you have to do is search for homeowner's handbook and there's a PDF copy that you can download as well. So we're going to go through a few things that are in the handbook here. Uh, I apologize, the screen's a little small and hard to see, and the sun is in my eyes. So some of the key things that we need to do to prepare, you'll always hear about throughout these uh, fairs about the emergency supplies that you need and the kit that you need, and those are important. And those are the things that even here, as I realize, the isolation that you have in West Maui is difficult to wait to the last minute. The beginning of fire and hurricane season, you should have these supplies ready to go. And then, of course, you're planning for your family on what you should do. And that's not just for hurricane, but also for tsunami and all some of the other hazards that we have. And then you should know the difference, it's explained in the book, between what a watch is and what a warning is. It's very different in uh, being alert and hearing when that converts and it changes the actions and your amount of preparedness uh, between the difference between a watch and a warning. And you should always have not just adequate uh, food and emergency supplies, but what about your insurance policy? Because uh, even if you're hard in your home and you've done the things that you need to do to prepare, there's usually some sort of uh, damage or some sort of things that you need to be covered for with your insurance. And of course, as you know, if you have a mortgage and you own your home, the bank requires the hurricane insurance, but not always the flood insurance. So you should look at the differences there and what they uh, should have. And lastly, uh, prepare your home. You know, the, there's the continuous load path, which we're going to talk about today. And there's also window protection, and also the trees and the roof. So we're gonna cover that in a little bit of detail today and talk about what this means. And you know, I've worked with a company that makes some of these ties, and it really, uh, is sometimes hard, uh, you know, when you get a phone call the night before a storm's about to hit, and somebody asks, where can I buy the ties? And they want to harden their own, they want to go install them the night before, when they should be getting their water and their emergency supplies already. It's too late. It's too late to install it at that time. In between the storms is the time to do it. And we're going to talk about how to do it, how much time it takes to do it, and how much uh, it costs. And uh, last year at the Eva Fair, I was there last year, I had several homeowners come up to me and say, you know what, we have installed and retrofit the ties in our home. And I just want to tell you, you know, and sometimes when you go to these fairs on the weekend, on a Saturday morning, like we were all setting up here this morning before the mall opened, and you know, it's great to be here and participate. Every once in a while you're like, this is my weekend, you know, it's got to get up at seven o'clock and go to this thing. But the most rewarding thing is to have homeowners come up to you during this show, during the fair and say, you know what? I installed these clips. I saw you last year. I went out and got them. I put them on my home. I sleep better at night. Thank you for making these things for us. And that was rewarding. It's like, wow. It's made the whole day worth wow. We estimate there's about 700 homes in the state that did not have any clips in them at all, have been hardened. They installed their clips, and that's great. We hope we can do like 7,000 more. Um, and, it, and you'll see later on, it's just not that complicated to do so. We get a lot of your misses, and as our friends from the Weather Service will tell us, it's just a matter of time that one of them will not be a near miss. And uh, not that we wish that to happen, we just need to be prepared for it. Because the statistics, all we have to do is look back at the Niki to realize the devastating effect. This was two days before the landfall of Hurricane Isel in 2014. It's hard to see, but you know, there's a variability in the path of Isel. Remember, it hit the big island quite well. Here's the storm we named after Anna in uh, 2014. Uh, this particular storm could have swiped the whole entire island chain, 
and the, the uh, winds were sustained during this storm, but fortunately it veered south and then later uh, to the west. <laughs> and look, and uh, it's hard to see, but this is all the storms that have been around us. So if you take the law of probability, eventually one will go over us. And that's where we really need to uh, be prepared. Last year we had three category four hurricanes in the Pacific all at the same time. All marching, two of them were marching toward us. We were just lucky that uh, those uh, died out or veered off. And of course this year we had Madeline and, and Lester uh, that got close. And fortunately once again, uh, but so we've got all these wake-up calls, we've got all these warnings that are coming through. I was just reading Pacific Business News, and the author, the editor, was writing in there how we were all preparing for Lester and getting ready for it, and rightly so. But he's, and I hope there's nobody here by the name of Lester. But he says, if we're about to get wiped off from the face of the map, could we use a better name than, well, we were just wiped off by Lester? So that, that we should put that request in with Noah. Aniki, Aniki, uh, the island of Kauai was hit by Eva and Aniki. And when we do preparedness fairs in Kauai, uh, everyone knows what the effect is. They know that uh, there's uh, a real emergency there. They know that they can't get, they have to have their supplies. They're going to be without electricity. All of these things that happen, the homes, the number of people that had to leave their homes, uh, direct hit at, uh, in Hanapepe. And uh, there was an emergency preparedness fair uh, last month in Hanapepe. We could not get there because the hurricane was coming at that time. And they had a very successful fair and we're going to be following up this month. And Iki uh, passes west of most of the populated islands and unfortunately hit Kauai. And if you kind of look at the statistics there, you know, if it had turned north six hours earlier using the devastating effects model of what happened on Kauai, now about 50,000 homes would have been damaged and destroyed instead of 6,000. So just think of that, you know, hitting more populated area like Maui or Oahu, what's going to happen and what will happen to the communities. So uh, we take a look at the statistics. There are 41% of the homes, of the 15,200 homes, were damaged or destroyed. And we had 4,200 with moderate to my, uh, minor damage. 7,000 people in Kauai were left homeless, lest we forget. Where do they stay? If they can't stay with family, they have to be put in emergency shelters. And there's not always enough shelters for everyone. FEMA came out with a report after Aniki, and this is probably the thing that changed everything the most in Hawaii. And they said this successful performance resulted from clearly defined and continuous load transfer paths from the roof to the foundation. Those houses that had these survived, and those that didn't blew, blew away or had significant damage. So there's a lesson to be learned from that. The other thing that they pointed out was failure of glasswork. In other words, windows, sliding glass doors, and hinge doors breaking contributed to a significant percentage of damage to buildings. So those two factors are what we're going to concentrate on today that are described in the homeowner's handbook. Uh, if you are a homeowner, I encourage you to get a copy because there are some things that you can do so that you won't become one of the 7,000 homeless during the next storm. The continuous load path. The continuous load path is the part in the building code today that requires all new construction to have hurricane ties and hurricane clips in the buildings. So the question is, you know, when did we start requiring clips to be installed? And it was right after Hurricane Eva. And then when did we require the use of clips going all the way down to the foundation, just not hurricane ties, but everything? That was after Hurricane Iniki. So you can see the building code is a reactive element. It's a minimal code. It's what we have to do, the minimum requirements for the safety of the people. And uh, we just kind of react to the storms that are out there. So the good news is uh, any new house built today has these clips, has these ties in them. But the older homes, and you don't have to go far back, uh, they don't have them. So the continuous load path is just so that the framing elements of a structure from the top, the hurricane ties, if it's two stories, strapping between floors, and then anchorage down the foundation, are uh, holding the house together. 
So if you look at the age of the house, you have uh, the least protection would have no clips. And then uh, around 1990 uh, in Maui, we started using them in new construction. And then the continuous load path all the way to the foundation started in 1995 here in Maui. And then the uh, county started adopting the new building code with the continuous load path. So post-1995, houses already have them in there. So how many people here live in a house that was built before 1995? I'm, I'm one of them. So unless it's been retrofit, it doesn't have clips in it. The good news is we have clips available today that you can use to retrofit a home. So we'll talk about that a little bit. So in Hurricane Aniki, back, we just go back to 1992, there were a lot of lessons learned back in uh, Hawaii. At about 90 to 95 mile an hour winds, this is the famous shot from the Honolulu Advertiser that's used every year during hurricane season. I happened to visit this house, uh, and I don't have the video, there's a video with this as well. It's uh, in Kapala. The homeowners were home at the time, it's a two-story home, and the neighbors were watching as the roof started swelling and swelling and before it finally blew off. And the neighbors videotaped this, and when it started flying in the air, they were all laughing and applauding and screaming. And <clears throat> After I'd seen the video, if I was the one in that house, I would have been like, hey, what are you guys laughing about my house for? Fortunately, nobody was hurt. But why did this roof blow off? Because there was nothing holding it down but toenails. Toenails was the way to build up until 95. You just toenail the roof down, just on an angle. That can, uh, a nail uh, installed in that configuration can, is lucky to hold 100 pounds. When the minimum requirements for the building code in Hawaii is estimated that each rafter needs to resist at least 400 pounds. In fact, the new building code is more around between six and 900 pounds. And all that is is just a clip installed in there, hurricane tie, to keep that roof on. That's the most vulnerable part. So companies like mine, we make a whole bunch of hurricane ties. That's what we do. We make the clips and ties. And they came to us saying, which tie do you have? Well, you need to retrofit these homes. And so we were looking at them and we were going out and we were working with different contractors to see what the ties were that worked. Now if it was a double wall house, there were a lot of ties that worked. The problem is the house is already built. How do you get the tie in to tie the rafter down? It's got siding on it. So that was a challenge. The other challenge is most of the homes built all the way up through the 80s were single wall homes. And they didn't have the studs in there, they didn't have the traditional uh, configuration that the clips would work like we have in the mainland. So that was an issue. We had to take a look and try and design something that would work. Now what we found for some single wall homes and most double wall homes, you could get the clip in there in a retrofit situation that looked like this. But for most of them it would not, for 90% of them it would not. So what we did is we came up with a special clip, a special tie just for Hawaii to fit on our homes here, whether they were single or double wall. And it came out with this HPT clip, which we nicknamed the Hawaiian Plantation Tie. And this is the way it works. It's installed on the outside of the home, and it is screwed into the wall, and it can work on a single wall home, as long as there's a trim board there. And then it extends around the freeze board, and it's screwed into the wrap. So what we did is, you can see all these bends and embossments on them, there's some samples on the table over there. We used this, we were able to test it and get about 400 pounds of uplift, which is where we wanted to be to meet the Hawaii building code. So there was finally a way to retrofit single wall and double wall homes that didn't have the clips on, so at least we could hold the roof on. Because the big key word today is shelter in place. We don't always have the shelters available for everyone or the space required. Unless there's no place like home, as Dorothy said. So here's a house that was retrofit by the author of the book, by Dennis Sunwalk. He went out, he actually did his in-law's house in Pearl City. So he went out there and he spent three Saturdays himself on a ladder, it was a single story home, and he spent $300 in the material, and of course his time was free, and he spent four hours each Saturday over three, that was 12 hours total over the course of three, three weekends. And that's what he did. He put the $2,000 up here because if he had hired it to be done, that's what it would have cost him to have it done. And now this particular home has the clips on it, 
Uh, the, it's a single wall house. He rest assured that this roof will probably not go flying off in the next storm. So he's actually documented it in his book that we have. And he's gone through better than any promotional material the Simpsons Frontier could produce because he actually did it. He shows what tools he used. He says how much time it took and what the materials were in order to do it. Uh, what is the alternative? It's maybe your roof comes off of during the next storm. So the other thing is he took a look at his own home, which was built after 95 in the White Kelly area of Oahu. So he climbed up in the attic, and back then he was required to have the clips. So he got up in the attic, it's really hard to do. Teresa and I were talking earlier about trying to get up in the attic and look in there and see how the clips are installed. So he did, he went up in the attic where the standard clips are used, and he noticed that this particular clip, which is an H2.5, had four nails in the top tab and only two in the bottom. So back in the 90s, when these clips were first introduced and required by the building code in Hawaii, contractors were not used to installing them. They didn't know that they had to fill all the holes in order to achieve the uplift load. So when Dennis looked at that, he was alarmed because he said this house, which was built during modern code, it, it was misinstalled, it wasn't installed properly. So he insists in his book that people check their homes to make sure that the clips are actually there, even though they were already required by the building code because maybe the inspectors and the contractors didn't quite get them in right. So what he did with his home is he went up and he experimented with some of the other materials we have, and there was an easy way to put a six inch screw. Now he intentionally missed to make sure, but he went back all the way around the outside of his home and installed these long six inch screws, which gave a 600 pound load capacity and reinforced his existing home, which was built in 96. So Dennis is always trying to tinker and figure things out with his home. So what about the continuous load path? What about taking that all the way down? If you're gonna do just one thing to your home, if it was built before not before, that would be to make sure that your roof stays on. That's the most vulnerable part. But if you wanna go the extra yard and make sure that it really stays there during the work, like a uh, Nikki storm, then to complete that load path down to the foundation. Now what do you do if you have a single wall post in your home? There's a lot of these out there. Well, there's a way to uh, complete the load path with the post and pierce foundations. Most of these are sitting on tofu blocks with termite pans, and they're just sitting there, they're not anchored down. And after the 2006 earthquake on the Big Island, we went around and looked at many of these, and they fell right off their foundation. And that is a problem because then all the piping and electrical gets disturbed and creates hazards. Uh, here's the photograph taken in 2009, a bracking of a home that came off its tofu blocks. And uh, this is what usually happens. The kickers that are there, uh, bracing back to the uh, uh, homes, come out. The nails actually pull out in that area. So actually, University of Hawaii in Hilo has put together a program online on their website. If you go to UH uh, Hilo and put in their uh, earthquake retrofit, there's a program on there where you can actually enter if you do have a posted peer type home, uh, where you can go in and type in your dimensions and, and reinforce the home. Don Thomas down there uh, put together with some graduate students a really cool program. First of all, it, you identify which island you're on. And then secondly, how close you are to the shoreline. And then it, it, it has you go under the home and, it, and you don't even have to know much about construction, it tells you what everything is. And then you, me, you count the number of posts, you measure how far apart the uh, braces are, and you enter it in the program. And then what it will do for you is it'll spit out the drawings in a PDF format, which shows you what you would do to reinforce that post and pier foundation to properly anchor it down into the foundation. Now, Dennis didn't want to stop there, he actually went back to his in-law's house in Pearl City and actually worked on retrofitting the foundation on that home. So he, first of all, he had to remove the decorative board on the outside so that it was exposed, exposing the post and pier. And then he picked up some of the hardware that's outlined in uh, Don Thomas's Hilo uh, program. We actually installed the parts in the foundation and then we put in these uh, knee brace stabilizers. So already you can see, uh, this is greatly reinforced from what it was before. 
<clears throat> and when he got done, he had, uh, you know, both he had to cut through the termite pan to, in order to put the hole down on, and he just goes through all this incredible detail. And that's what's really unique about these homeowner's handbook, because it gives a step-by-step -step guide how to do it. So um, I won't bore you with every screw and every nail that we put in there, but once we got done uh, with the uh, exercise, because I helped Dennis out, supplied some material, then this is what it looked like. And I think you can see the tofu block, the termite pan is still there, but we provided a load path bypassing down into the footing. So this particular home not only will do well in uh, the next hurricane, but also do very well in the next seismic event, which we may have. So he's just comparing falling off the, the, the tofu block, or actually, uh, and it looks very substantial. It, it, it is probably a little bit of overkill in the program, but this is one way to reinforce a post and pier home. So what is the next thing uh, to talk about? What is to keep your roof on? But what about your neighbor? You know, are they keeping their roof on? You know, unless you're living in an association that's gone through and actually done a program with a contractor, probably not. There's going to be flying debris, maybe some pallets flying around or other things. They could. And why is that significant? Well, this is why, because what we have is uh, an enclosed building or a partially enclosed building. Now the building on the left, you'll notice when the wind comes, it's exerting forces and lifting the roof or pushing on the wall. But when you penetrate that structure, and some people believe the best thing to do is open up all the windows, and that's fault. When the wind comes in the house, it exerts double the force. So if you hit, the roof didn't come off already, it will come off now. So it's important to close off your windows and doors to, so that flying debris doesn't penetrate your home and cause the, uh, the, uh, the structure to blow apart. Uh, here's an example of uh, uh, simple storm panels consisting of plywood. You see it all the time on TV. It's less common in Hawaii. The building code today in Hawaii, we're following the 2006 building code, there were requirements in there to do this in Hawaii. But because of costs and concerns, it was taken out of this code cycle. Uh, when we adopt the 2012, it's just to see if, it, if it's uh, really something that we'll do. If you look at the anatomy of your home around the window, there's double two by fours, at least usually all the way around it. And those can be fastened to using storm panel screw hardware. So the idea is to install the hardware, have pre-cut plywood, that's one way of doing it, so that when the storm comes all ready to go, all you have to do is deploy it. If you're gonna try and cut the size of plywood and install the hardware after there's a hurricane warning, it's too late. So some contractors are already providing these with the home. So there's four, four P's, as Dennis calls it in his book. It's to pre-cut the plywood, to pre-label it, so you know which board goes on which window, so you're not trying to figure it out at the last minute. Pre-mark the faster locations so that they're all ready to go, and then pre-drill the holes in the plywood so that you don't have to do that uh, during, uh, during the storm. And here's just an example. Dennis actually did this. He's deployed the plywood on his home now for the last three hurricane warnings on Oahu. So he's actually gone through this and improved on uh, the speed. So sometimes what he'll do is partial deployment. He won't put all the fasteners in. He'll wait to see what the hurricane's gonna do. And then if it's coming closer, he'll install more. Because, uh, you know, there's an effort in, uh, in putting these together. He stores his plywood panels in his garage. And they're all properly marked. And plywood isn't the only way to go. The NOAA Center uh, at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, uses shutters. Of course, they invested in that. They need to be operational even during the storm. Uh, that's probably the most expensive way to go. There are also steel, aluminum, clear plastic shutters. Like in, in these, there's also a screen, kind of like a trampoline, that'll block the debris from coming in. It's a little bit easier to deploy, especially if you have a two-story home. So you have all these different uh, choices from roll-down shutters to plywood, and these are all ranked here based on cost. The most expensive ones are on top, and the least expensive are on the bottom. So if you look at the cost versus time to deploy, the most expensive ones, like Hurricane Center NOAA, University of Hawaii, all they have to do is push a button, and they're deployed. They just close. Well, those are expensive. 
If you use the plywood ones, then you have to either you or somebody has to actually deploy them, and that would be the least expensive, but the most effort. The other thing you have to be worried about are uh, debris. And it, it right around your own property or your neighbor's property, immediately around the home. As we all we had to do is look at Hurricane Gazelle on the Big Island, you can see a number of trees that came down. The rule of thumb is the distance from the tree to the house should always be greater than the height of a full-grown tree. In other words, you don't want that tree to come toppling down on your home because that can cause considerable amount of damage. And what else does it do? It penetrates the home so the wind can get inside, doubling that wind pressure. So it's important. Uh, there's also some things that you can do in the attic for cross bracing. Uh, Tropical Storm Ezel taught us a lesson. Uh, you know, in the, in the building code, most of the nails and fastening around the edges uh, need to be installed. Sometimes contractors miss that. So uh, that's the parts that are most uh, vulnerable. And you can see in this photo from the Big Island, in the Buna district, ex that's exactly true. That's where the roof failed. It was right along the edges where they weren't uh, reinforced with extra fasteners. So that's kind of uh, another thing that uh, Dennis points out in his book uh, that it's very important to take care of. Another one to pay attention to is many of us nowadays have solar. And the solar companies are responsible for their uh, attachment to the roof to make sure that they're not going to go flying off in the wind. Uh, I was discussing this earlier. What an excellent time if you're installing solar panels to actually put the extra clips in a home if they don't have them already. And then ask the solar company, what are their fasteners rated for? Because the worst thing is to have all these expensive solar panels go flying in the wind as well, because that's like a sail. So their mounting system and fastening to the roof is very important. One of the last things I'd like to cover is uh, hurricane insurance. Uh, you know, if you have a hurricane insurance, you've got wind-related damage. You have water damage when the wind creates a hole in the wall and roof. So the water damage coming from a hurricane can only come from the top down. If it's coming in from a flood, then the hurricane insurance doesn't cover that. And a lot of people aren't aware of that. If the water is coming from the ground up, then you need to have flood insurance to cover that damage because your hurricane policy won't necessarily cover that. So there are a few things to consider for your insurance. You have your typical fire theft, but then you have your catastrophe insurance, which would be hurricane and then flood. You got to think about the replacement cost versus the market value of the property. You got to consider inflation, uh, the building code compliance improvements, and any uh, surge demand. And then you got a waiting period you know, once you get that insurance. So, when it comes to insurance, and we've talked about retrofitting homes, most of the Hawaii carriers, Zephyr, ICAT, et cetera, <clears throat> when you have your hurricane insurance policy, if you install the clips on your home, say they don't have them, say it was built before 95, then you get a 50 to 20% reduction in cost on your hurricane policy. And that's significant. Imagine if you take that uh, the cost, Dennis said it was $300 to put the clips on his in-law's home, and he still gets along with his in-laws, by the way. If you take that cost, that $300, now you're getting a 20% cost savings annually on your premium for hurricane insurance, then it pays for it itself. In fact, in the long term, after three, four years, you start saving money on your hurricane policy alone. If you take it all the way down, the load path all the way down, and you do the storm shutters, you can get up to 25, maybe 30% savings on your hurricane insurance policy. So there's a real incentive to make sure that you have that because you can pay for it uh, based on your, your insurance policy. Hurricane evac evacuation planning. Uh, you know, the, we're all talking about being prepared. And one of the things to do is to act now. We're not, we don't have a threat right now. Uh, now's the time to put clips on the home. Uh, when Lester's a few miles away, that's not the time. That's the time to make sure you've got your plan in place. And once you have all your water and your supplies, then where are you going to go? Where are you located? What are you going to do? Are you going to go to a public shelter? Or have you fortified your home that you're going to shelter in place? Obviously, sheltering in place is good if your home can sustain it. So, 
whether you have a single or double wall home, whether you have even a concrete or a CMU home, those are all things to consider. And uh, what uh, Dennis has come up with is a model, because everyone's talking about sheltering in place. How many shelters do we have? And you know, over on Oahu, we have a lot of shelters, but not all of the shelters would I what place where I want to go, because they may, may not be built to a superior code, code, building code. They may be less safe than the, the home that you're in, right? So you have to take that into consideration. So in the book, uh, he's put together a table of what type of home do you have? You have a single wall home that has nothing, no clips. You have a single wall home with clips. You have a double wall house that was built after 95. Do you live in a, uh, a house where you have storm panels, uh, window coverings? Do you live in a concrete house that has hurricane clips? This chart can kind of tell you whether you need to go to a shelter or whether you can shelter in place. So it really gives you some great uh, guidelines uh, in this particular book on what to do uh, during a storm, whether it's a hurricane, there's tips in this book about tsunamis. Uh, if you're living uh, near the coastline, if you hear the siren, or if you feel the ground shaking, what do you do? You know, a lot of times we need to remember that. We need to review that with our families. Uh, where's the meeting place going to go? If the cell phones go down, where are we going to meet our children if they're uh, outside the area? What happens during a flood? So I would encourage everyone, even if you don't own a home, there's uh, great tips of information in the homeowner's handbook. Uh, that you can pick up and review. This uh, is the third edition and it's practically sold out. Uh, Dennis is currently working on the fourth edition already and he just keeps expanding it. Hawaii was the first Sea Grant program that works on disasters uh, through the University of Hawaii to produce a book like this. It's very simple. Uh, when I look at a book, I like to look at the pictures. It's almost all pictures inside. And uh, the other thing is that this has become so successful uh, it's become the model for the rest of the country. Uh, Dennis has put 13 other editions together for different states. It's all tailored. You know, they're not reading about Hawaii, they're reading about their own state. You know, they have one for uh, the Carolinas, there's one for New Jersey. There's, he's doing one currently for Alaska. He did one for the Marshall Islands. So it's tailored for their own type of uh, emergencies and disasters. So I'd like to thank everyone. If you have any questions, uh, if we have a little bit of time, for questions, anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. You mentioned the roof uh, may go. It's uh, uh, what you say, uh, 90 miles per hour. How many miles per hour are we going to make to the roof? Well, that's a good question. The question was, uh, how fast does the wind speed need to be? Uh, because I showed a picture of 90 mile an hour winds taking that roof off in Hawaii. Or how much would it be to lift the whole entire house off? And uh, it doesn't, it just occurred, you know, the 90 mile an hour uh, during the Niki, it took that roof off, but on Oahu, when we have uh, winter storms of 60 miles an hour, where I live in Kaneohe, we, we get uh, roofs lifting off just in 60 miles an hour. But for the whole house, you, you'd have to be, uh, you start getting up to category three, category four, if you start talking a Niki storm where some will slide off the foundation or actually get overturning of the entire house. That would be in a, in a stronger, very strong uh, hurricane. You're talking a Katrina or a Andrew type hurricane where that would happen. So that's why the continuous load pad is important to anchor the house all the way down during a severe hurricane. But mostly here we get the category one and two. So if you're only going to invest a little bit in hardening your house, tie the roof down because that's the greatest risk that we have. We may not see another Iniki right away, but we will see, um, you know, a Madeline or a Lester striking one of the islands, and that's where we need to keep our roofs down. So if you're really into it, like Dennis, he's anchoring everybody, you know, his in-laws and his house is down to the foundation. Uh, if some people that is a little bit more expensive. For $300, you can tie your roof down, right? So that would be the, uh, the one that would make the most sense. Well, my roof I believe, I'm gonna check, was tied up already, and my house is older than that house, and I didn't need it, so I'm worried. Yeah. Well, that's good. It's good that you worry, because now's the time to worry when there isn't a storm, and just to check the clips, make sure they're not rusting out, make sure that all the, the nail holes are filled, and then see what you can do about maybe 
protecting your windows and you know if you're I know you're on a slab or you're on a post in here. Yeah. Yeah, so then you might want to start looking if it's wet, accessible underneath the home to see if there's something you can do to make the post appears a little bit stronger. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.